Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by our audiobook, paperback, ebook, book <laughs> titled 50 Dinosaur Tales. And you can get a copy at bit.ly slash 50 dinosaur T A L E S. This week in our 279th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new dinosaur, which was actually found in the 1860s, but has a new name, (laughs) and a bunch of resources if you're trying to learn or teach at home. While social distancing. Yes. We also have an interview with Alita Bayuel, which is all about DNA potentially that was found in dinosaur fossils, as well as some other really interesting things that didn't get covered in most news sources. So you can hear it straight from her. (laughs) And we have dinosaur of the day, Heterodontosaurus. I also want to mention that since we're all social distancing and longing for more human contact, (laughs) we've been coming up with some more ways to interact with the community And what we're announcing this week is we're going to have a Jurassic Park watch party this Saturday on our Discord. And it was really tricky to pick a time to do this because we have listeners all over the world. So what we did was we looked at our Patreon and everybody that had addresses in there and figured out a time that would work for the most possible patrons. And what we came up with was 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time which unfortunately is 2 a.m. UTC. So anybody in Europe, unless you're a real night owl, might be kind of tricky to watch this with us. But it should work out for everybody in the U.S. and Canada, as well as in Hong Kong and Australia, which is where a lot of our listeners are. And real quick, a couple other time zones. It's going to be 10 p.m. on the East Coast, noon in Brisbane, and I think 10 a.m. in Hong Kong. So hopefully you can watch with us. Yeah, since we're going to be watching on all sorts of different media, I decided we should have like a sync up point because depending on when you press play at the beginning, there can be all sorts of weird intro stuff like, you know, it's a felony to do piracy and all that stuff, but you don't always see that. So what we're going to do is right before the universal globe starts spinning, that's where we're going to all hit play at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. It's very specific. Yes, precision is important. (laughs) So yeah, so that's going to be the starting point. I'll put a reminder in the Discord. I'm going to make a new channel for this watch thing. We're going to try doing text only and see how that goes in the Discord server. But next time, maybe we'll try voice or something if people want to try that out, something different. So if you're a patron and want to watch Jurassic Park with us, then make sure that you've downloaded Discord so that you can chat with us while watching. Yeah. And if you're not a patron yet, you can join between now and Saturday and <laughs> yeah. watch with us. Exactly. I guess technically you could watch without being a patron and just imagine the conversation that's happening. But if you want to be a part of the conversation, definitely make sure you're a patron and on the Discord. And speaking of patrons, this week we have a list of patrons, like we always do, that we want to thank for keeping the podcast running. And this week we want to thank Kyle, Brendan Kavanaugh, the Tolbert family, Remy Rodriguez, Rohan, Bradley, Bilal, Avery, Albertosaurus, Trev, Ayrton and Everett, Greg, Jared Copeland, Leah, and Bill Jago. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your support, and I hope to see you all in the Discord on Saturday when we're watching Jurassic Park. Yeah, it's been amazing. We haven't really had a lot of patrons drop off, which I was kind of expecting because the world is crazy right now, but... If you do have some reason that you can't afford to pay for a month, there are some complicated ways in Patreon that we can work through it. So just send us a note if for some reason you can't afford to pay the Patreon fee because of the coronavirus and we'll work something out. Yeah. And, you know, if you're excited to watch a movie with all of us and chat at the same time, then consider joining patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news... As promised, I have a newly named but long ago discovered dinosaur. This one is a sauropod. Nice. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. It was published in the Swiss Journal of Geosciences and written by Daniela Schwartz and others. And one of the others is Philip Mannion. And it's an incredibly long paper. I don't know if that's his doing, (laughs) because we've talked to him about how sometimes they end up with some really long papers. But it is a very thorough description 
of the dinosaur. One might call it a monograph. So yes, it's very long, very complicated, but we did the reading so you don't have to. It's actually an incredibly important find. This sauropod is, quote, the only skeletal find of a sauropod dinosaur from Switzerland, end quote, even to this day. So the first one was found in the 1860s, and we've never found another good skeleton of a sauropod in Switzerland. It's from the Jurassic about 155, maybe 157 million years ago, which is similar to the Morrison Formation in the U.S., although it might be one or two million years older, which in geological time is nothing but obviously compared to us <laughs> and the timescale we live at. That's a very long time, so these animals may not have been coexisting. Like I said, it was found in Switzerland in the 1860s, specifically in northwest Switzerland, and then that area was later restricted for the Swiss military until the 1990s. But for a long stretch of time, they didn't really know exactly where the quarry was anyway, and I think now they've got a pretty good hold on where it is. There's not great documentation since it was the 1860s. We didn't have GPS. Maps of mountains were kind of sketchy to draw. And on top of that, they weren't excavated by scientists. The bones were just excavated by people working in the quarry. And some of the bones were sold privately and presumably are still unknown to science. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah. But Jean-Baptiste Greppen got wind of this. He's a geologist from Switzerland. And he managed to secure the remaining bones for the Natural History Museum in Basel in Switzerland. And that's what this whole description is about. So the original sauropod bones were mixed in with crocodilomorph remains and a theropod tooth. And as a result, most people assumed that it was a theropod because the teeth are pretty easy to identify. So you see that tooth and you figure there's a tooth, a bunch of dinosaur bones, must have been a theropod and these are its bones. <laughs> but there's other reason there might be a theropod tooth near a dinosaur bone. <laughs> like maybe it was eating that dinosaur. Exactly. Or they just died near each other. The theropods were shedding teeth like crazy, so they're just leaving teeth all over the place. You make it sound like they shed teeth like we shed hair. They, they kind of did. <laughs> it was like every month they were losing teeth. Because he thought it was a theropod, Greppen named it Megalosaurus marianae, which was a new species of Megalosaurus. Classic t wastebasket taxon. Yeah, but I mean, in the 1860s, there were not a lot of named dinosaurs, and Megalosaurus was one of the only theropods named, so it made some sense. But later on, it went through a few other names. It was called Labrosaurus, which I think is like an allosauroid, also based on that theropod tooth. Then it was called Ornithopsis, which is a sauropod. And finally, Cediosauriscus grepini. So it changed species name. Yeah, I think it switched when they were starting to name a sauropod rather than naming a theropod mm. because it was based on the other bones rather than being based on the tooth. Pretty sure that's when it switched So with Ornithopsis. But in any event, now it has a new name <laughs> because they've decided that even though Cediosauriscus is a valid genus, it's not similar enough to be lumped together. Plus, Cediosauriscus is presumed to have lived 5 to 10 million years earlier than this dinosaur, so it's likely that they wouldn't have been the same anyway. So the authors picked a new name, and they named it Amanzia, after Swiss geologist Amans Gresley, who is an incredibly important Swiss geologist. He, quote, discovered the first dinosaur fossil from Switzerland in 1856, end quote. So obviously he deserves to have a dinosaur named after him. Yeah. To find the first ever dinosaur in a country. So now the full name is Amanzia Greppeni. The first part is after the guy who discovered the first dinosaur fossil in Switzerland. The second part after the one who discovered Amanzia <laughs> about 10 years later. It's fitting. Yeah, but it took a long time for either of those names to reach the dinosaur. And obviously this means that they kept the species name again, as you usually do when you're just reclassifying an individual. The find is really impressive. They describe it as at least four sauropod skeletons. Unfortunately, they're disarticulated. Still. Yeah. And I mean, they could have, I guess, potentially been articulated. They didn't mention this in the paper. But since they were all excavated by people not taking any notes on what they were excavating, you really can't say for sure that they were disarticulated. Sure. And some of the bones have been sold. Yes. And but I mean, they're definitely disarticulated by the time scientists were describing them. Many of the bones are broken, which was possibly due to poor excavation technique. 
but there are a lot of bones in the mix. They include vertebrae, ribs, shoulder bones, legs, arms, hips, and toes. I think there's really only like one toe. (laughs) Unfortunately, there's a lot more of the other bones. And the official description includes all of those bones. They include them as a sin type, which is a really weird thing that you don't usually see. So usually you make a holotype, you find one individual or one bone, and you say this is the bone or the skeleton that defines that genus and species. But there is no holotype because all four of the sauropods were found at once, jumbled together, and then passed off without much documentation. So instead, this entire group of individuals form a syntype. Hmm. So syntype is like a holotype, but with multiple individuals. It's pretty weird, something you don't see very often, but they couldn't really do anything else with the information. Right. And that just means if you find new fossils, you have to compare it to all of these. Yeah, which is pretty weird. I'm wondering if they eventually do find a new Amanzia, and it's clearly, you know, the same genus and it has similar characteristics and everything, they might make it a neotype Hmm. and then get rid of this whole crazy sin type thing. But until we find anything new, this is all we have to go by. So you just kind of have to stick with it. They also referred some more material in addition to the sin type, which include a tooth, some of the skull, lots more vertebrae and ribs, and a ton of just fragments, like bone fragments. The tooth has, quote, D-shaped spatulate tooth crown, end quote, which is similar to early eusauropods. You can think of things kind of like Camarasaurus, that sort of, I mean, stuff that was in the Morrison Formation, obviously, (laughs) those basal eusauropods have some things in common. Unfortunately, the skull isn't all that useful. They say that it doesn't really give any information on the skull shape and it's the top back of the head and a little bit in front of the eye. So it doesn't have any of the jaw or really the most useful parts of the skull. There's no brain case or anything. So it's not great. <laughs> it's better than nothing though. But we can tell quite a bit about the limbs, tail, and pelvis. One of the unique features that they call out is the rugosity, which is basically a wrinkle-like texture on the humerus in a specific spot, which I think is usually linked to muscle attachment. Hmm. So... There's some interesting stuff going on there. This paper is more about describing in painstaking detail this dinosaur and why it's unique and not so much ideas about what it might have behaved like and things of that nature. That's why it's like a monograph. Yes, exactly. So overall, combined with the syntype and the referred bones, they have 124 bones which are identified as Amanzia. It's a lot of bones from a lot of individuals. Yeah, and especially for a sauropod in Europe where we really don't get many bones in general, let alone in this nice little bone bed situation where they're all from the same type of dinosaur. In the paper, they say, quote, at the time of the description by Hune in 1922, none of the material had undergone either cleaning or preparation. All available material was first cleaned and reprepared where necessary, and final cleaning was carried out in an ultrasonic bath, end quote. Hmm. So even though these fossils have been around for about 160 years, <laughs> they had never been fully prepared. But people were still talking about them periodically, a lot of times saying that it was probably a nomon dubium and that this genus probably wasn't worthy of a name, even though the fossils had never really been prepared and closely studied. It's really interesting. I think it's because of that weird history where it was a theropod briefly and then you know it wasn't collected by scientists and it's a big jumble of multiple individuals that people just assumed that it wasn't worthwhile and kind of ignored it for so long yeah but there's so many fossils i know it's and it's really significant especially for the time and the area where it was found they also took a histological sample or a bone slice from one of the bones but unfortunately they didn't have any clear lags On the other hand, fortunately, there were some other details about the bone structure which was visible, and this led me down this weird rabbit hole of this 2008 Klein and Sander paper about sauropod histology. (laughs) So in that paper, they define 13 histological ontogenetic stages, or as they call them, HOS stages. I don't know why there's an S and then stages afterwards. It's like ATM machine where the M means machine. Anyway. <laughs> Is that a pet peeve there? <laughs> it's just, you don't put the letter in the abbreviation. It's like USA of America. You know, it's, it's already, a, anyway. 
So <laughs> they identified these 13 stages, and it's based on the type and structure of bone in the legs and arms, or the long bones, as they call them. And the Amanzia specimen that they tested was assigned to stage nine, and they basically go up. So one, stage one is the earliest, youngest bone type, and then stage 13 is a fully skeletally mature sauropod, where the sauropod would have been fully grown and, you know, at its maximum size, basically. So at stage nine, they think it was still growing quite a bit, but it would probably just recently passed sexual maturity, although obviously far from being skeletally mature. The best estimate from the Klein and Sander paper puts stage nine sauropods at between 60% and 75% of their full growth size. And these individuals ranged from between 7 and 10 meters, or 23 to 33 feet. So even though it wasn't fully grown... It's pretty large. Yeah, I mean, not really for a sauropod. A lot of sauropods are like 100 feet long. But in the Jurassic in Europe? Yeah, it, I mean, it was probably one of the biggest things around, as sauropods usually are. But I think even as a fully grown adult, it would have still been significantly less than 50 feet long. It's a little misleading, though, because it was pretty stocky. It had a relatively short neck and tail compared to popular sauropods like Apatosaurus and... Diplodocus. Yeah, Diplodocus especially. <laughs> with that crazy tail. So even though it was 50 feet long, the bulk of its body might have been a little more similar to something that was 60, 70 feet long. So yeah, it was big. You're right. I wish I was only in stage nine of my growth phase. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I think one of the most important things about this Amanzia paper is it points out how important it is to look at older finds and that, you know, you could have one of the most significant finds from an area just waiting to be prepared like this, which is by far one of the best sauropod finds in all of Europe, especially from the Jurassic. And it's just been sitting there with people writing about it like once every 30, 40 years, <laughs> and that's about it. But it's a really cool sauropod. I'm wondering if now that that quarry is available for scientists to look at, now that the Swiss military is allowing people into it, if they might be able to find something else there too, that'd be really nice. Well, also having this really detailed paper helps in terms of future studies of this sauropod too, which is really cool. Yeah. Got to find them first though. Yeah, but you can always go back and look at it from a different angle and maybe look more at the phylogeny or other characteristics. Yeah, I didn't really mention the phylogeny because they tried two different versions and both times it was just in sort of unnamed no man's land <laughs> or just really early uh, usor pods. So I think that's probably the best way to describe it. So we have a few resources we want to share with people because as Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, we're all kind of self-isolating or social distancing, and I know that there's a lot of people out there who are now uh, homeschooling their kids or teachers that are teaching remotely, or maybe you are just looking for new things to learn. Yeah, fill your time with something more constructive than watching Netflix until it shames you with the are you still watching question. Yeah, <laughs> which comes a little bit quickly, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> we just found out that there's a way to see animals in 3D using augmented reality apps, and there is one for dinosaurs. It's called Monster Park AR, and it's on Android and Apple devices. You can virtually get out of your house, if not physically, and spend time with dinosaurs at the same time. That's true. We haven't downloaded this yet, so... Not sure exactly how it goes, but it sounds cool. You can see dinosaurs, you know, in your own environment and apparently at scale. Oh, it's augmented reality, not virtual reality? Yeah. Oh, so I guess you're still in your house. You just have dinosaurs in your house with you. Yes. Which I, I guess is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> New friends. It's nice that they're not in real reality and just digital augmented reality because I would not want a dinosaur in my house, birds or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so you can listen to them growl, you can change their skin, and you can take photos to share. And also it says something like, touch those monsters and see what will happen. So they do stuff. 
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> So that's just one of those things you can do if you're at home. But we've also put together a resource page that has links to online courses and books and interactive virtual tours in museums and other educational resources that are all free while we're sheltering in place. And we plan on keeping this page as updated as possible. I'm actually about to add a couple more resources tonight. But to give you an example of things that you can find... The Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology in California has just put out guided virtual experiences, and you can learn about paleontology from the comfort of your home through their guides. The Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History also has a virtual tour of all their current exhibits, which was really cool because we keep wanting to go there. But Yeah, they just redid the exhibits, too, so you can see the new ones if you haven't been there since what two years ago or so and they redid the the whole hall of dinosaurs Mm -hmm. we also have a number of resources that if you're a teacher or a parent at home you can use as lesson plans and there are some that are uh, science investigations for improving critical thinking there are weekly web chats with the alf museum and western science center and then there's lots of videos about fossils and learning about how bones fossilize or what fossils can tell us about ecosystems and things like that. And a lot of those are through Smithsonian Science. There are a couple of online courses. We've been recommending these for years. They're still free. And that's Dino 101, Dinosaur Paleobiology. By the University of Alberta. That's Mm. a really good one. Yes. And then the University of Hong Kong Dinosaur Ecosystems, which is another great one. Yeah, the Dino 101 is more of a introduction to all dinosaur stuff. And then the Hong Kong University is a little bit different because it digs into one specific area in Mongolia and they talk about the ecosystem right there. So it's a little more in depth. I would recommend if you're thinking about doing both to do the Dino 101 course first because it's a little bit more background. Definitely. There's also a number of dinosaur and other paleontology books that are available for free right now to download. And also coloring pages and activity sheets. So if you want to print something out and have something physically available. For younger dinosaur enthusiasts. Yes. And then we have a few other things too. I also included live cams of birds because I thought that was fun. (laughs) They're technically dinosaurs. They are. (laughs) And there's a bunch of books that are free right now too, right? Yeah. And then there's a few museums that have digitized their collections if you want to peruse as well. So lots of different things to do and see and learn. And again, we'll be updating this as we hear about more resources. And there's a link in our show notes too, or you can go to inodino.com. And I just made a shortened URL in case you can't get it out of the show notes. But if you go to bit.ly slash dino (laughs) distancing. That's a fun one. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little easier to remember than the long form inodino.com slash blah, 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 blah. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Alita Bayuel. But if you're a patron, we also have an extended version of it on there. So if you prefer the extended version, listen to that on your custom RSS feed. And then you could skip over this unless you want to listen to it again. (laughs) We're joined this week by Alida Bayuel, and she is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, better known as IVPP in Beijing, China. Her research focuses on the microscopic structure of dinosaur bone and tissue using histology, and she has also studied modern alligators and birds to learn about dinosaur tissue and biomechanics. Thank you so much for joining us again. You're welcome. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) So your new paper is one that, again, is looking at cartilage, and this time it's hadrosaur cartilage, but the unique thing about it is that you're reporting that maybe there are some remnants of DNA in it. Could you describe the specimen that you were looking at in this paper? I think you said it's a supraoccipital, which yeah. would be like a bone in the back of the head. Yeah, exactly. So um, I actually asked Jack, I was like, okay, tell me more about you know how you find these specimens and what year. So like I know I can tell more to you know people, right? Mm-hmm. So he said um, that he, you know, he found this nesting ground in Montana, right? Northern Montana. So it's a hadrosaur nesting ground that he found, I think, in 1987 or 1988. Pretty sure it's 1988. 
And he found this with, you know, his son and Carrie Ensel. She's a preparator at the Museum of the Rockies. And so they discovered this nesting ground and there was with a lot of nestlings, right? This articulated nestlings of the hadrosaur, hypacosaurus. And then there was also a nest, uh, you know, with eggs and the embryos were weathering out of the egg and some were still kind of inside the egg. And oh, so, wow. yeah. So for, you know, this study, we use two different bones. So that we say two different specimens. So two supra occipital. So that's a bone in the back of the skull, uh, kind of like above the foramen magnum, right? Where the, the, the spinal cord comes out, right? Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, so the first one, it was actually cut, cut up by Jack or some of his graduate students uh, back in, you know, 1988 or around that time. And it was made into a ground section. That's where the first things uh, we saw, they come from this specimen, right? So the ground sections, and you can see, you know, some cells that are at the end of cell division. And then another cell also looks like, you know, it has chromosomes. And then from another specimen that we, because, you know, once the cells, once the specimen is embedded in resin, it's in plastic, right? It's hard to do any chemical study on this. It's a really thick slide. You can't really see anything if you stain it. So we had to use a second one. So a second superoxypital of the same size from the same nesting ground. So let's say maybe, who knows? I don't know. Maybe they were <laughs> brothers or sisters. I don't know. <laughs> right. And then that one we had to demineralize. So that was, you know, much more recent. Uh, we didn't do that in the 1980s. You know, <laughs> we did that, mm -hmm. you know, in 2015 or something. And we had to demineralize that one and do more chemical tests on that one. So there's two specimens that we have. Gotcha. So after you demineralized it, that's basically like soaking it in acid to dissolve the bone, right? What what was left over? So I guess if you just look at uh, what's in the, the floating solution, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you demineralize your fossil, it's in the, uh, you know, demineralizing solution. So... We did two different types of experiments, right? So we took some fragments that were demineralized and there you still, you know, the cells are still kind of linked together, even though all the mineral, pretty much all the mineral is gone and they're still linked together by their extracellular matrix, which means they're still organics, right? Otherwise, if you demineralize everything, if technically, if it's only mineral, then you shouldn't, um, you know, have the cells still linked together. But, mm -hmm. And then, you know, in a, for another experiment, we took like, you know, the surrounding solution. We pipetted that into little centrifuge tubes. And that's what we did for, you know, to isolate some cells and to oh, do the, cool. some DNA stains. Wow. I haven't heard of that being done before. Is that a brand new thing? So, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mary Schweitzer is the first researcher to do that on, you know, fossil cells to isolate them. But then I don't mm -hmm. want to say something wrong because maybe Pauliki also did that um, a few years ago, but I'm not sure. So I guess that one, ask Mary. <laughs> but I'm pretty <laughs> sure she is the first one to start isolating fossil cells like that. So you've got your supraoccipital that's in resin, and then you've got your supraoccipital that's demineralized and has all this amazing stuff in it. Did you just pick the other supraoccipital that wasn't in resin because it's the same as the one that was in resin? Or was there something about a supraoccipital that made you think that that's the right bone to demineralize? Not at all. We just went into the, um, you know, the collections. I opened the drawer. We tried to find a supraoccipital that had the same size as the other one. And, you know, because we just wanted to stay comparable to the other one, right? It, it's probably better to pick a supraoccipital than a femur, <laughs> you know, just to be, to be consistent. And then I remember I picked two or three and then I showed Jack. Um, and then I said, okay, Jack, which one can I, you know, which one can I, can I use? And he just said this one. I was like, okay. All right. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Which one can you dissolve in acid, basically? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, there are so many isolated skull bits and uh, limb bones from that, you know, from that side. There's so many of them. You open the drawers and it's like, it's like a treasure. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's so many of them and they're all aligned beautifully in the, in the, um, in the drawers. It's like art, but there's a lot of them. So um, it's not like there was one superoxypital or two. There was probably 10 or 12, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that there's, for that side, there was at least 12 individuals of nestlings. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. It's so strange that there would be any sort of taphonomy going on with these nestlings and they're still there to be fossilized. Cause I always figure either it gets buried and preserved or something comes around and eats it and it doesn't get preserved. It's, it seems strange to me that it would be, you know, not buried long enough that it could be disarticulated and yet still preserved at all. Mm-hmm. That's such a strange. And then also that even, you know, in that situation, it gets preserved in like miraculous conditions because we haven't seen this kind of preservation elsewhere. Or do you think that's just that we haven't looked for that preservation elsewhere? Um, you mean, actually, uh, there was even better morphological preservation found in a fern, a fossil fern from the mm. Jurassic. So it's even older. It was published um, in like, I think, 2012 in Science and by uh, Benjamin Bonfleur et al. And, you know, they made ground sections of this fossil fern. And you can see all the different cell cycles, prophase, oh, wow. metaphase, anaphase, telophase into, you know, this fossil fern. And I was like, when I saw that paper, I was like, that's incredible. And, uh, but they only did, um, you know, ground sections. They didn't uh, investigate the chemistry. So I am pretty sure that actually this type of preservation is more common than what we think. And, you know, also because when we work on vertebrate fossils, we mostly, we look at bone, right? Because that's the the tissue that really fossilizes the most commonly, right? Bone is Mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, except if if you're talking about chondrichthians, I think I'm saying that word right. (laughs) (laughs) But so actually, you know, in bone, bone cells, they don't divide anymore, uh, osteocytes. And there's no cell division. So, of course, you can't see, you know, these mitotic cell cycles in bone, but cartil- in cartilage, so what we call highland cartilage, that's where you have cell division. But that usually is not commonly preserved because it's not mineralized. But in the calcified cartilage, you can still see the cells at the end of cell division. And that, you know, this transition between calcified cartilage and bone, that's where there's also a lot of cell death happening. And actually, uh, you know, the nuclei condense also in cell death. So I think calcified cartilage, people have not really looked at it enough because there isn't a lot of calcified cartilage, you know, in the fossils. It's only in like, it covers the ends of the bone. So it's a very thin layer, um, you know, at the, um, let's say, end of limb bones or the end of uh, the bones of the skull base, right? So that's really mm-hmm. rare, yeah. So I think this is really a tissue that you know, we say it in a paper, we think it's better to preserve biomolecules than bone because also there is not vascularization, there is no nerves, and there is less oxygen than in bone. And actually there is, if you compare bone and cartilage, there is more minerals in cartilage because, yeah, I, I think like people measure the amount of uh, minerals, you know, calcium and compare it between bone and, car- and calcified cartilage. Actually, there's more in cartilage. So, wow. yeah, we we propose a lot of, you know, some new hypotheses to say probably cartilage is a better tissue f- to look for biomolecules or cellular structures in fossils. Gotcha. So in this case... Mm-hmm. Was there cartilage, because we're talking about bone, but since it's a nestling, was that like mineralizing cartilage? Is that why we're seeing cartilage in with the bone when you demineralize it? Yeah, so just think, just imagine like a a little baby bird 
or also a baby human, right? So when they're born, <laughs> <laughs> any, anything, uh, uh, something as a baby, okay? <laughs> Some bones start as bone and then they fuse. And others, they start as cartilage and then they slowly turn into bone. But at the edges of these bones, like the supraoccipital, you still have cartilaginous joints that then fuse later on through adult life. They become totally bone, right? But in this case, we are in a cartilaginous joint that wasn't completely ossified in the supraoccipital. And it was and it was calcified, but it wasn't fully ossified yet because, you know, it's like young, um, a, a young, a, a baby dinosaur. In the paper, it talks a little bit about, or I should say, you talk a little bit about exceptional conditions which are required in order to get this kind of amazing modern material, mm-hmm. modern samples. Mm-hmm. What do you think those exceptional conditions might be? Is it, you think it's just related to like temperature or is there something else that, you know, we can't, the fossil needs to be preserved in, in order to make it all the way to the present in a way where you can demineralize it and find all this cool stuff inside it? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I would lie to you if I said I know how it got <laughs> preserved. <laughs> and I don't want to lie. But so usually what we learn in textbooks, which probably is not right, is that <laughs> you, you need rapid burial and something anoxic. And also sometimes you can also have bacteria that help um, accelerate mineralization. So obviously the rapid burial looks like it wasn't the case. Then uh, I don't know anything about the temperature. Like I have no idea. But um, you know there was a recent paper published by Yasmina Wayman. Uh, Wayman, sorry, I mispronounced her name. At all in 2018, they did say that uh, you know exceptional preservation is more common in, in you know in sediments with oxidative settings versus reducing environments. So that's probably also one key. And then uh, they we also propose in the paper they may have been you know fast mineralization mediated by microbes. It's a possibility, but, um, you know, like I'm not going to just really say that we fully understand, uh, preservation of fossils. It's very difficult and it's like case by case. And I don't know why you can see these nuclei. And also it's weird because the bone, so like, you know, the cartilage is extremely well-preserved. And the bone is terrible. It looks so bad. It's so, <laughs> really? yeah, it's so dark. And, you know, the bone cells, they don't even have a really nice outline. And yeah, so it's quite, a, it's a, it's a mystery. And then again, you know, you see a bone, let's say like pretending I'm walking in the Museum of the Rockies uh, collections, and then I take a bone. I'm like, this bone looks terrible. It's, you know, the, hist- <laughs> the histology looks going to be really bad. Uh, and then actually I cut the bone and it's beautiful. <laughs> and then all the times you see a bone, it's beautifully preserved on the outside. It looks amazing. You cut it, you can't see anything. It's all altered by bacteria, fungus. So I don't want to say something that I don't know the answer to. So, yeah. So was the reason that you picked this supraoccipital because it, there was already the example that had gone through histology and so it looked like a good candidate because you could see a little bit of the details already yes. in the first sample. So when I arrived, so you know, Jack made those slides in like in the, you know, like I said earlier, in the 80s. And then he described the limb bones and he looked at the skull slides, but he never published on the skull slides. And then hmm. I in 2010, I arrived at the Museum of the Rockies to do my PhD. And I was supposed to, you know, be working on the joints of, of dinosaur skulls. So like found in between skull bones, like sutures or synchondrosis and everything. Look at the cartilage, the bone, and figure out how the the skulls of dinosaurs fuse or do not fuse together. And then he said those slides, no one really looked at them for 20 years, more than 20 years. And then so I was just there and then, you know, I didn't even speak good English when I first moved there. You know, it was like basic. You know, I just moved to a new country. I'm just looking at these slides. 
And, you know, I spent days just looking at these call slides, trying to learn. I, I wasn't sure what I was doing at the time, just like learning, reading. And then I saw these, these structures. And that's when I was like, what is this? That's, <laughs> I was like, that's insane. Yeah, I was like, I remember my classes from high school in Tahiti where we looked at, you know, some plant cells under this microscope and we we studied all the different types of cell division, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. I remember I was like, I know that this looks like a metaphase. <laughs> and then, yeah. So I, we didn't know, like we just, it just happened. We I wasn't like, let's look at this superoccipital because it's the best bone. I just randomly, it happened. That's so cool. Yeah. So we, we've talked a little bit about a couple of the tests that you did, but I don't think we've talked about immunofluorescence yet. Could you tell us a little bit about what that showed you? Yeah. So just to understand why we did those tests, right? So first, the first superoccipital with the chromosomal, the nuclear structures, and of course, I showed this to Mary. And then uh, she was like, wow, that's incredible. You know, if you want to publish on your own, describing these structures, you, you don't need me. Because I, I was asking her, like, give me some advice. What, what do I do? She was like, you know, if you want to publish these, uh, just describe those structures, you don't need me. But if you would like to look at the chemistry she offered, she was really nice. She was like, if you want to come to my lab, I can train you. And, uh, you know, to, to look at the chemistry. Because we saw these incredible nuclear structures in, on, in the first place, we thought definitely there's going to be some biomolecules preserved. So that was our test. We thought there's going to be biomolecules preserved. So we did in, uh, histochemistry, you know, trying to see if, if you use a stain uh, that you apply to normal cartilage of extant species, you know, if you apply this stain, the cartilage becomes blue. And the mm -hmm. bone just stays transparent or slightly blue, right? And so we applied the same stain to the fossil cartilage that we demineralized and it became blue. So I was like, so we thought there is definitely preserved chemistry, original chemistry, and probably some acidic compounds because that's why, you know, it becomes blue in extant species. So those are called glycosaminoglycans. And then we did, but this is not a specific test. Then we did a second, more specific test uh, so this is using immunofluorescence. So um, on the demineralized cartilage, uh, you know, all the slides, they're like two nan 200 nanometers thick. You know, we had mm. to cut them on an ultra microtome. It's pretty insane. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't do it. I, I watched uh, Wang Xia Zeng. Uh, we call her Megan. I watched her do it. I was like, I don't, <laughs> I'm not doing this. That looks too complicated. <laughs> No, it's really insane. And you have to look into that tiny little hole that shows you, um, you know, you can see your floating sections into a drop of water. It's one drop, drop of water. <laughs> and then you pick up the section using an eyelash. Anyway, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> so, and then, so on these slides, you apply antibodies that come from a chicken. I guess if we want to be more precise, it's actually... So we, to create, to generate that antibody, right? Some, you know, scientists, researchers, we didn't do this, right? This is made in a separate lab and it's freely available to all researchers. If they want to buy an antibody, they just go online. For that, you need to insert, inject collagen type two from a chicken into another species. Mm. And then, yes, yeah, so then you use the immune system of that species because um so let's say in our case it was a rabbit right so it was a rabbit anti-chicken collagen type 2 antibody <laughs> i like the so, anti-chicken i know, <laughs> <laughs> I know funny so it's like so some scientists injected collagen type 2 from a chicken into a rabbit and then the rabbit you know freaked out was like oh my god why <laughs> do i have a protein that does not belong to me inside my body. And then, so the immune system of the rabbit generated antibodies that recognized the collagen two of the chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, you know, it technically recognizes them as uh, an enemy. You know, scientists, they got the serum from the rabbit and isolated the antibodies raised against collagen type two. That's to be, if we want to be really, really precise on what 
is technically that antibody that we used. Cool. And then do, do they add something to that antibody so that it fluoresces or does it just do that naturally? Okay, so now if we want to be even more precise, <laughs> so that was the primary antibody that does not have any uh, anything that fluoresces. Then we had to use a secondary antibody. So now you're going to laugh, okay? <laughs> Are you ready? So it's a goat anti-rabbit <laughs> antibody. <laughs> so basically uh, now using a goat um, you know, so you generate antibodies against anything that's from a rabbit, from a goat. <laughs> gotcha. So, and th- so this antibody actually has a molecule that fluoresces, mm. and so then that one, if it binds to something, so if it's gonna bind to the rabbit antibody, which you know is bound to the collagen two in mm-hmm. the dinosaur. So secondarily, you have this uh, immunofluorescence reaction. And the only reason why we have two antibodies is only because it's cheaper to make this less specific fluorescent antibody than the primary one, you know, like uh, because the primary one is very specific to anti-chicken collagen type 2. Hmm. And it would be extremely expensive to make it fluoresce. So that's why we, yeah. So it's only a matter of money. And uh, then... If there is collagen to preserved in the, you know, in the material, they're going to bind uh, to to the slides and then you rinse them, you know, very well. And if you stimulate the slides under fluorescent light, it becomes green. And it was, you know, the test was positive. You, we had a lot of these green areas in the fossil uh, cartilage, which means there is preserved collagen too in, you know, in the dinosaur. Nice. And is is collagen 2 the one I think you said earlier? Do we have collagen 2 or is it a bird mm, collagen? No, we, we also have collagen 2. Okay. So how do you make sure that you're not finding your own collagen in the, in the test accidentally? Yeah, that's a really good question. So actually, with this specific experiment, it was very easy to rule out that it was human collagen type 2, because collagen type 2 is found in cartilage, right? So uh, in our bodies, the cartilage is like on our nose or our ears or at our joints, you know, and it's inside the body. Hmm. So in order for it to be a contamination from human collagen 2, it would have to, for some reason, our own cartilage would have had to get inside the the samples and that's just not possible <laughs> unless you're you know, doing it with like a in like an er and there's <laughs> cartilage flying yeah, all over the place yeah i've never seen cartilage <laughs> fly all over the place so i think that we're pretty safe for this specific method and case that it is not human collagen type 2 in there cool but that that's a valid concern so <laughs> thanks for the question thanks so I guess I have to ask about the DNA next. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Because now we finally, <laughs> finally we can get to there. <laughs> so I guess just take me through what you did with the with the DNA testing. Okay. So for the first cartilage uh, specimen where we saw the nuclei, right? Nuclei and then chromosomes. First of all, here you see... Uh, you know, that there are these nuclear structures and they're like a little darker, they're stained. And then there's outlines of chromosomes. So we thought, how, just, I'm just asking anyone to tell me, do you really think that in this material, it's only what minerals or pigments, you know, because it's a little dark, right? It's, it doesn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense that, you know, these beautiful structures would be preserved without some organic remnants, right? Because there is organic remnants around the cellular, like the extracellular matrix around the cells. Why not inside the cells? Why wouldn't, mm-hmm. why would molecular preservation only be possible around the cell and not inside the cell? Like the molecules, they don't see the difference. So anyway, (laughs) but let's say, of course, DNA is a really fragile molecule, but we can get back to that later. So first of all, test one, 
look, morphological test using our eyes. So we could see the nuclei and the chromosomes inside the first suprachiasmatic. So we're like, okay, let's go test if there is something inside the cell, uh, you know, something chemical that can suggest there is still some nuclear material preserved. So in the second suprachiasmatic, right? In like I told you, so you put the suprachiasmatic into a little uh, demineralizing solution like EDTA for weeks. You let it there for at least two weeks, and then we took. We pipetted some of the, um, well, you change the solution every day, right? So we pipetted uh, some of the floating solutions, the cells, right, that are floating in solution. Well, we didn't know what we were pipetting when we do, but because it's like a, a few <laughs> drops, but we piped it <laughs> and then we put it into some centrifuge tubes and we centrifuge it for a while. Then at the end, you get a little pellet and you get rid of the, you know, what's above the pellet. Uh, because that's just, um, you know, we're not interested in that part. And then we use also some filters. So we just get the right cell size. You know, the, the cartilage cells are between um, like 10 and 20 microns usually. And then... Mm, so you're not getting all the big chunks. Yeah, exactly. We get rid of all that. And then, uh, so we also had bone cells actually into, you know, into our solutions, but we, we, you mm. know, we're only like focused on the cartilage for this paper. And so then, so once we have these cells, we, we did some DNA staining. So we did two different tests. So DAPI and Propidium iodide. So those are stains that are commonly used in, you know, in labs on extant species and they, they stain the DNA. And we also use, you know, because sometimes some stains, they cannot go into the cell membrane. You have to permeabilize the cell membrane. So we permeabilize the cell membrane with the solution. And then we incubate, you know, these these um, cells with, uh, you know, the, the DNA stains. And then after that, we clean everything really well. We put them on a slide with a cover slip. And then we stimulate these slides with fluorescent light. And if there is DNA staining, you're going to see uh, DAPI becomes blue and then Popidium iodide becomes red. And in some of the cells, right, you could see that there is intracellular staining. So there's like a dot, especially I think the, the best uh, results are from the Propidium iodide, the red stain. So you can see inside the cells uh, some of the cells, we only show one in the paper, but there's more. I should have put them in, in sub-info, but anyway, too late now. Um, <laughs> so in the um, some of the cells, you have the nuclei. Right? So there's a dot that's standing inside the cell. And so that's what we hypothesize. We say this is a remnant of the original dinosaur nuclei. And because it's, wow. yeah, because it's staining red, we think... It's, you know, it's, it used to be original DNA, right? When the dinosaur was alive, it used to be original DNA. Now, you know, this structure, it still reacts to DNA stains. And then here's the thing that we are unsure. So we, first of all, we definitely think, I think for sure, it's not contaminating DNA. It's the original dinosaur nuclei with the original you know, nuclear material, but then we don't actually know exactly what it is. It can't. So that's why we say it's the chemical markers of DNA. We can also give another name, DNA fossilization products. So we have two hypotheses in the paper. One, it may still have some base pairs that are still preserved, but that would be like insane, but it's possible. You may still have some <laughs> DNA base pairs still preserved. Second part, second hypothesis, actually, maybe they are so altered, they may be, you know, yeah, altered base pairs. And um, so technically, and also, like, you know, DNA has a double helix uh, morphology, right? And then you have base pairs in the center that are linked to, together by hydrogen bonds. So perhaps we don't have this uh, conformation anymore. So technically, it's not. It's no longer DNA in the proper chemical molecular sense of the term, but it could be some products that were originally DNA 
that got fossilized mm. yeah, into some other byproducts, modified. And it's similar enough, it still gets stained yeah. like it was DNA. Yeah, so this is our hypothesis. And also, we, we also propose, because, you know, in the nucleus of all, like, um, you know, like cells, you in eukaryotes, you also have some proteins around the DNA, like histones. It's possible you also have some of these proteins still in there, not just DNA, right? Cross-linking is a process that has been shown to uh, facilitate fossilization uh, let's, mm. of proteins, for example. So we also say it's possible that this material is so, it's altered, it's cross-linked, but yet it still reacts like it has some DNA. So now, of course, like we are, we are not sure, like I'm not going to lie and tell you this is what it is <laughs> because I can't <laughs> tell you that, but um, we need to do much more work to figure out and characterize exactly those products. But I'm pretty sure that it is some original nuclear material from the dinosaur and it's endogenous and it's not contamination. So that's what I think. That's really amazing. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> is there, I mean, I know you must know way more about this because I'm sure you went down quite a research rabbit hole figuring out like how old the oldest DNA is and how old the oldest base pair is and all of these types of things. How much older is this staining than any other staining that's been done. So now you're asking me to do math. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm you could just give me an order of magnitude too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know that the the oldest genome, so it's not just some DNA, it's the whole genome is from mm -hmm. a horse that was seven hundred thousand years old. And our specimen here is 75 million years old. So it's so much older. However, mm -hmm. yeah, however, we can't fully uh, compare these two studies because, you know, the, the horse genome was made using DNA sequencing, sequencers. And in our study, we didn't use sequencing. We simply used DNA staining. People just don't usually use DNA stains on fossils because everyone thinks DNA can't survive. And I mm. so here is what I'm guessing is happening. So I think that the sequencers that we currently, you know, that are currently used in all the labs from all around the world, they probably just only recognize intact DNA, you know, like perfect base pairs, perfect sequences. And as soon as you have some type of chemical alteration, which probably, which of course happens during fossilization, I'm guessing the sequencers are not going to recognize what's there because they're altered base pairs. So that's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing that these machines, they're too focused, they're too specialized for perfect DNA, which makes sense. Mm. So we have to figure out a way to characterize what we have, what happens to DNA when it fossilizes. And I'm pretty sure maybe sequences are not the right answer. Maybe stains are not even the right answer. So now, you know, in our paper, we use propidium iodide and DAPI. And now, you know, I want to keep studying this, but I'm I'm not just going to use that. I don't want to just use these two stains. That's not enough anymore. You know, we have to use other methods and we have to see, try to see things in three dimensions. We can't just, we have to innovate and think outside the box now. But that's going to be really hard, but I uh, think that's what we have to do. So you can't just put it in a PCR and see what kind of DNA you have because it's it's not going to react to it correctly because it's not DNA per se anymore. It's like a cousin of DNA. Yeah, or there is, if or if the base pairs are preserved, there's probably just a few of them and the sequencers are only going to read one or two. You know, we I talked to some DNA experts of the IVPP. They're like, you're only going to get a one base pair read or something. And I'm like, yeah, so mm. I'm guessing just sequences is not the right way to go. Yeah, but you're right. I like I like what you said. You said it's the cousin of DNA. That's, that's cool. <laughs> I like it. The long distant cousin at this yeah. point. <laughs> I like it. Cool. So is there anything else you want to share about your work or this paper or anything? I guess right now it's controversial. You know, molecular 
paleontology is controversial, but it's controversial because we haven't fully understand everything and it's difficult. You know, we use these crazy methods and you have a, you need to have a lab. You need to make sure all your samples are, are okay in the freezer. And if there's like a, an electrical outage, you lose all your samples. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. very hard. And it's right now, at, you know, molecular paleontology has been controversial for a while. But that's because it's very difficult to find answers. And all we have to do is just keep working. And I know that in a few years, I don't know when, I, I don't want to give a, an estimate, but in a few years, molecular paleontology is no longer going to be controversial. Just give it a, like a, I don't know, a few decades. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe shorter. Who knows? But in a while, it's no longer going to be a controversial science. I think if we just keep working hard and we don't use old assumptions, we don't just stay with whatever has been said for many years. We can't just be like, well, everybody has been saying this, so it must be true because we, we no one knows. We have to keep looking until we're all satisfied with the answers. Cause right now, like I'm not even, I'm not satisfied. I want to know the truth. And then maybe someday, uh, everybody is going to be a molecular paleontologist because it's the right because it's the coolest thing and it's the easiest thing. And oh, we already know this. Oh, we figured it out twenty years ago. You know, so that's what I'm hoping that we can, you know, we can do in the future if we all like think outside the boss box, not the boss. <laughs> think outside the boss. <laughs> think outside the box and keep, you know, just keep pushing. And yeah, so I think, yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your latest work with us. We're looking forward to whatever you come out with next. Thank you for asking really cool questions. And thank you for, you know, thanks for everything. Thanks so much, Alita. I apologize. I was a little bit too sick to take part in this interview, but I'm so glad that you're able to talk to Garrett. This is such cool, interesting stuff. Yeah, and Sabrina's doing much better now. So thanks for all the well wishes that we've gotten. Yes, thank you to everybody. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to remind everybody that we have a dinosaur book that you may not have read. And if you haven't, I certainly recommend picking it up. It is named 50 Dinosaur Tales. And in it, Sabrina wrote 50 different short stories about different dinosaurs and what they were up to when they were alive or often when they died, because a lot of what you can tell from a fossil is how they got buried. And there are a lot of ways to get buried, it turns out. True. I'd say there's a number of friendship and maybe even love stories in there. A lot of eating going on, too. Well, I like to eat, so that heavily influenced. (laughs) Maybe she was writing some of the chapters while hungry. I'm not sure. (laughs) (laughs) Or just after a good meal. I can't remember. Yeah. It also helps that some of the things you can tell from dinosaur fossils are like tooth wear patterns and therefore maybe some of the stuff they ate, especially if there's gut contents. Yeah, and I do love gut contents. Yeah, that's got to get worked in there. The book also includes a bunch of short fact lists about other dinosaur discoveries that have been included in all of our top 10 dinosaur books. And then there are some additional ones from more recent finds too. So if you're interested in getting our 50 Dinosaur Tales book, in any of its forms, I recommend the audiobook form. You can go to bit.ly slash 50 dinosaur, T-A-L-E-S, 50 dinosaur tales. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Heterodontosaurus, which was a request from Paul via our Discord and Patreon, and also Dinosaur4602, so thanks. It was a heterodontosaurid ornithischian that lived in the early Jurassic in what's now South Africa, and Heterodontosaurus was a small dinosaur. It was between 3 foot 10 inches, 1.18 meters, to 5 foot 9 inches, 1.75 meters long. And it weighed between 4.4 to 22 pounds, 2 to 10 kilograms. Those are big ranges in both length and weight. Yes, but still overall small. Yeah, true. And these estimates are based on the holotype as well as the second specimen. The second specimen was much larger than the holotype. Mm. So... That's why we've got this variation. But it's not clear why there was such a big difference in size. It could be individual variation or sexual dimorphism or 
something along those lines. Heterodontosauridae have some of the smallest dinosaurs, like Freeditans, which was about 26 to 30 inches or 65 to 75 centimeters long. Heterodontosaurus had a short body with a long tail. It was probably bipedal, and it was probably a fast runner. It had these long, robust forelimbs that were about 70% as long as the hind limbs. It had strong arms. It was originally thought to be quadrupedal, but now it's thought that Heterodontosaurus used its arms for digging up roots and opening insect nests. The hands somewhat resembled early theropods like Eoraptor and Herrerasaurus. Heterodontosaurus had five fingers on each hand, and these fingers were long. Its hands were pretty large, and it used the five fingers for grasping. The first three of its fingers had large claws, and the fourth and fifth fingers were possibly vestigial. It sounds weird, but that's not too uncommon for early Jurassic dinosaurs. We just don't talk about early Jurassic dinosaurs all that much. Yep. Two of its fingers were opposable, so that meant it could pick things up with one hand. That would have probably been pretty advantageous. Yeah. Heterodontosaurus had long, slender hind limbs and four toes on each foot. The first toe on the foot, the hallux, didn't touch the ground. The bones in the toes were claw-like, not hoof-like. More advanced ornithischians were more hoof-like. There's no ossified tendons in its tail, so the tail was probably flexible. Heterodontosaurus has been depicted as having long filamentous integuments from its neck to its tail, so it looks bristly, and that's based on a description of a fellow heterodontosaurid, Tianyulong, which was described in 2009, and that dinosaur had those structures. Sounds a lot less fun when it's described as bristly rather than fuzzy. Right. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of the paleo art I looked at, I'd say bristly was a better term. It's probably a, a better description in general, because if you think about a feather, sort of the the structure of a real proto feather, it's a little thicker and more robust mm-hmm. than like downy fluff. A heterodontosaurus had an S-shaped neck and a small, elongated, narrow, triangular skull with large eye openings. It was probably herbivorous, maybe omnivorous. It had a horny beak that covered the front jaws, and it had three types of teeth, small incisor-like teeth long canine-like tusks, and chisel-like, molar-like cheek teeth. Thus the name Heterodontosaurus. Yes, all the different teeth. And there are no teeth in the beak part of it. (laughs) So it also is almost four teeth types because it's got the toothless part as well. Right. The premaxilla, the tip of the upper jaw, had three teeth on each side. And the first two teeth were small and cone-shaped, the incisors, and partially covered by the upper beak. And the third tooth on each side was a canine-like tusk. The first two teeth in the lower jaw were canine-like tusks, and they were bigger than the ones in the upper jaw. So it's kind of a weird-looking dinosaur. (laughs) There were also 11 chisel-like cheek teeth on each side for crushing and grinding after a gap behind the canine-like teeth. The middle cheek teeth were the largest, and they decreased in size. These teeth had long roots and a heavy enamel coat, which was good for wear. Making it extra weird. The teeth got smaller as they went farther back. Yeah. (laughs) So the cheek teeth have uniform wear and tear, so they formed at the same time. There's no evidence of newly erupted teeth, you know, replacement teeth. Heterodontosaurus probably moved its jaw back and forth. Tholburn suggested that Heterodontosaurus needed to replace its teeth regularly because it ate tough vegetation, and it may have done that with estivation, which is like hibernation except you do it during the summer. Well, you can. Estivation is any period of long torpor. I'll get into that in the fun fact. Oh, okay. (laughs) But anyway, there was this period of time when it wouldn't need to eat. That might have worked since it lived in this desert-like habitat with hot, dry seasons that would have had little food. But Hobson questioned this in 1980 and found wear patterns on the teeth that showed vertical and lateral, not back-and-forth movements. They also found variables in tooth wear, which showed continuous teeth replacement, Though he did say x-rays of the most complete specimen didn't show any unerupted replacement teeth. Weird. So Hobson rejected the estivation idea due to lack of evidence. Yeah, that is, it's kind of a stretch there. Talking about basically hibernation because you don't see replacement teeth. So Butler and others in 2006 CT scanned a juvenile heterodontosaur skull and found no replacement teeth. But they argued that there must have been tooth replacement because the juvenile had the same tooth morphology as adults and the teeth would have changed if the tooth grew continuously. So they concluded Heterodontosaurus had sporadic tooth replacement. Makes sense. Just about every dinosaur did have at least some tooth replacement. So 
In 2011, Norman and others described the upper jaw of another specimen and found unerupted replacement teeth. And then Paul Serino in 2012 described a juvenile with unerupted replacement teeth. Success. Confirmed. <laughs> yes. But in 2012, Serino said Heterodontosaurus had some features in its skull and teeth that showed an herbivorous diet. The beak with the cheek teeth for cutting vegetation and the cheeks to keep the food in its mouth while chewing, as well as having enlarged jaw muscles and the position of the jaw joint so that the bite would be evenly spread meant that it probably ate tough vegetation. We've actually talked before about chewing and jaw muscles of herbivorous dinosaurs. If you want to hear more, check out our interview with Ali Nabavizida in episode 205, Yamaceratops. But anyway, since Heterodontosaurus was so basal, this may help show the shift from early carnivorous dinosaurs to being herbivorous. Laura Poro in 2008 said, quote, It's likely that all dinosaurs evolved from carnivorous ancestors. Since heterodontosaurs are among the earliest dinosaurs adapted to eating plants, they may represent a transition phase between meat-eating ancestors and more sophisticated, fully herbivorous descendants, end quote. Yeah, and just as you'd expect from a weird transition like that, it's a super weird dinosaur with all sorts of crazy evolutionary, you know, almost like it's just trying stuff out. Trying to, you know, evolution is just going all weird. <laughs> Why not throw three different types of teeth in one head and see if it works out? <laughs> <laughs> so not many juvenile heterodontosaurs have been found. Not much is known about how they changed as they grew, but the eye sockets seem to have gotten smaller as it grew up. Relatively smaller. And that happens in pretty much all dinosaurs. And the snout became longer and had more teeth. The types of teeth they had were the same, so juveniles and adults probably had similar diets. In 1974, Tholburn thought that there was sexual dimorphism with the tusks, saying that males had tusks and females did not. But tusks were found in a juvenile skull, so that wouldn't be something that they developed later for mating. And also, most of the skulls found have tusks. Originally, the tusks were thought to be used for defense or display, and that heterodontosaurus was herbivorous, but now it's thought that heterodontosaurus may have been omnivorous and then used the tusks for killing prey occasionally to go along with its claws. Going after the prey would have been an advantage in the dry season when there was less vegetation around. A 2016 study found that Heterodontosaurus may have used its tusks by grazing against the lower beak while it was cropping vegetation. So Heterodontosauridae is one of the most primitive or basal groups of Ornithischian dinosaurs. And Heterodontosaurids are mostly found in southern Africa. They've also been found in Eurasia and the Americas. The type and only species for Heterodontosaurus is Heterodontosaurus tuckeye, and the genus name, as Garrett said earlier, means different tooth lizard, and it refers to its teeth, which were unusual <laughs> and different, or heterodont. The species name is in honor of George C. Tuck, who was the managing director of the Austin Motor Company of South Africa and who supported the expedition. The holotype was found during a British and South African expedition between 1961 and 1962 on a mountain at an altitude of about 6,200 feet, or 1,890 meters. Wow. Heterodontosaurus was described and named in 1962 based on a skull by Alfred Crompton and Alan Sherrig. The skull was nearly complete and slightly crushed, but the postcranial remains that belonged to the skull weren't actually found until 2011. The holotype is now at the Zico South African Museum. So since they didn't have the skeleton when they were describing it, only the front part of the skull and lower jaw were described when they named Heterodontosaurus, and that description was said to be preliminary. And very few early ornithischians were known at the time. It was really hard to prepare the specimen because it was covered in this thin, hard, rusty layer that contained hematite that could only be removed using a diamond saw and that damaged the specimen. Oh. The second specimen, though, was found in 1966 in the Elliott Formation, about 5,807 feet or 1,770 <laughs> meters above sea level. And that one included the skull and skeleton, and it was articulated. Nice. That's worth the climb. Yeah. So that second specimen was described in 1976 by Albert Santaluca, Crompton, and Cherig. The four limbs had been discussed in an article by Peter Galton and Bob Bakker in 1974, and that helped establish that Dinosauria was a monophyletic natural group. Many scientists at the time thought that Saurischia and Ornithischia were not directly related. 
Other specimens of heterodontosaurus have been found, including one in 2005 in a stream bed near Grahamstown in eastern Cape Province of South Africa, and that's the most complete individual found so far, but it was too hard to remove because of the rocks around it. So they scanned at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in 2016, and it took five days to scan. They found it was a juvenile. Richard Tholburn suggested heterodontosaurus was a junior synonym to Lycorhinus in 1970. Lycorhinus was named in 1924 and also found in South Africa. Tholburn reclassified heterodontosaurus tuckeye to Lycorhinus tuckeye and said it was a distinct species, you know, same genus but different species, because of small differences in the teeth where, and where it was found. Tholburn also named a third species of Lycorhinus, Lycorhinus consors, though Galton in 1973 disagreed with this synonymization. Cherig and Crompton agreed in 1974 that Heterodontosaurus and Lycorhinus were in the same family, but they thought they were still separate genera, especially since the holotype of Lycorhinus and Gustadins, the type specimen, was so fragmentary and not well preserved that it was too hard to compare against anything. James Hobson eventually looked at the holotype of Lycorhinus and said Heterodontosaurus was its own genera in 1975, and he also changed Lycorhinus concerts to be Abrictosaurus concerts. Good old lumping and splitting. Yep. Always changing. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place as heterodontosaurs included Lesuthosaurus, Massospondylus, and the theropod Meapnosaurus, as well as other heterodontosaurids, and other animals included amphibians, turtles, and crocodilomorphs. And our fun fact of the day was a suggestion from Paul on Discord, although I was already thinking about it because great minds think alike. So... <laughs> Last week, we were talking about different dinosaurs and their body temperatures in relation to each other, like the difference between a sauropod and a troodon, for example. But we didn't talk at all about modern dinosaurs or birds, and it turns out that they also have a higher body temperature than humans, much like most extinct dinosaurs did. So there's a paper in Comparative Biochemistry and Physiology by R. Prisinger and E. Schlucker, and in it, they go through a whole review of different birds and what their body temperatures were. But in summary, <laughs> the overall average for all birds in all activity states is 38.54 degrees Celsius or 101.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So warmer than humans, but really not by much. It's pretty similar. But during high activity, bird temperatures can exceed 43.9 degrees Celsius or 111 degrees Fahrenheit. And some birds can also run on the cooler side, including when they're in cold environments, when they're lacking food supply, or if they're nocturnal. Nocturnal birds also are a little bit cooler. Then there's another set of birds that can enter what is essentially a mini hibernation every night called torpor, and so can some mammals, usually on the smaller side, which can drop their temperature as low as 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit which sounds crazy to us because obviously our body temperature doesn't drop that extremely at night. It also reduces how much energy you're using. So you don't have to eat a lot. Like say you're a hummingbird and you just have to eat constantly while you're awake. At night, you can go into torpor and not die from starvation because you can't eat during the night. If the torpor continues for a long time, the definition of it becomes estivation, which is what Sabrina was talking about earlier. And it's sort of like hibernation, but it can happen at any time that you're in torpor for a long time, in the summer or whatever. And it seems to happen automatically. So it's not like hibernation where you have to prepare for it. Like bears, you know, they eat a ton of food and then they do all this special stuff so that they're ready for a long hibernation. It seems like most animals that go into torpor and estivation just sort of do it <laughs> when they don't have a lot of food around or they're not going to be moving around much. During those phases, though, the temperature of birds can, quote, even fall to four and a half to seven degrees Celsius, 40 to 45 Fahrenheit, without obvious ill effects, end quote. It's crazy. They can drop their temperature down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit and just wake up and yeah. be fine. That would be incredibly handy if we could do that. So in general, birds are a little bit warmer than us by a couple degrees Fahrenheit, but they can be much warmer than us and much, much, much colder, <laughs> depending on if they're taking advantage of fancy torpor abilities. But I also want to quickly talk a little bit about human temperature, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about what human temperature is. We touched very briefly on it last week. The 
temperature of 37.0 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is based on a study by the German physician Karl Wunderlich. And he based this temperature on what he claimed were over a million armpit readings of 25,000 patients taken over many years. And because he was using 1800s, I think 1860s also technology, which means that he was pretty close by where Amanzia was getting discovered. <laughs> an aside to an aside. But while using this old school thermometer technique and getting it in armpits, apparently those thermometers took about 15 minutes to equilibrate. So doing 25,000 patients with this 15 minutes per measurement, it must have just taken like a lifetime to do this research. It's crazy. But he found some interesting stuff. Like I already said, the 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit number is almost always attributed to him. He also found that between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m., readings averaged just 36.2 degrees Celsius or 97.2 Fahrenheit. And between 4 and 9 p.m., they averaged 37.5 Celsius or 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which means an average of over 2 degrees Fahrenheit change during the day. So 98.6 might be an average random sampling, but it's not an average in the morning. If you had a temperature of 98.6 at 8 a.m., you might be running a fever because your temperature should be a little lower. Then 120 years later, Makawayak et al. published new results in JAMA, and they did just 700 oral readings of 148 participants, which is really nothing compared to that original study. They found that the average was 36.8 degrees Celsius or 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which some people have reported as, oh, human body temperatures have gone down over the last 120 years by 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. But it could also be explained by the fact that it was armpit readings versus oral readings, possibly a more accurate thermometer or differences in behavior of the people who are getting tested. There's a million different things that could lead to the small difference. But to summarize their results, because I think it's pretty interesting, they found very similar results to Wonderlick in that there was a low temperature in the early morning and a high temperature in the afternoon. In their studies, they found that the 4 to 6 p.m. maximum was 37.7 degrees Celsius or 99.9 .9 degrees Fahrenheit. And as a result, they suggest defining a fever as anything above 37.2 degrees Celsius or 99.0 degrees Fahrenheit in the morning or 37.8 degrees Celsius or 100.0 degrees Fahrenheit in the evening, which is really interesting that whether or not you're running a fever depends on the time of day. But they also caution that it varies quite a bit from person to person. Some people have a huge variation throughout the day, as much as 1.3 Celsius or 2.4 Fahrenheit, and other people virtually stay consistently the same temperature all the time, varying as little as 0 0.05 Celsius or 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're interested in seeing what your body temperature is, you could take some readings throughout the day and just see if your temperature is different in the morning than at night. And then it's also useful if you think you're running a fever because now you have a baseline that you can compare to and see if you're higher than your own baseline. Comparing it to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit means absolutely nothing. It means a little something to compare it to 98.2, since that's a more accurate average <laughs> for modern Americans, at least. But really, there's so much individual variation that unless you're above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you probably don't have much to worry about. But it's always useful to find a baseline first. So keep that in mind if you think you're running a fever. Yeah, I want to find my baseline now. I'm going to have to do some experiments. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And consider joining our Patreon if you haven't already. Patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Again, we'll be viewing Jurassic Park together this week. At 7 p.m. Pacific on Saturday. Join us in the Discord. Yep. Thanks again. And until next time. 